muita satisfação, eu vou mediar este painel, denominado Novas Demandas dos Consumidores. Recebo aqui, é, com muita satisfação, Gus Guadagnini, é, que tem uma vasta experiência em proteínas alternativas, Bárbara Soleiro, Uh, também zootecnista e que trabalha aí na produção de lácteos, de leite, com um trabalho grande, Pedro Arruda, uh, também uh, um preposto nosso em Londres, que cuida aí do mercado de açúcar e etanol, uh, e, remotamente, Janelle Meyers, que é diretora de sustentabilidade uh, da Kellogg's, uma empresa aí, presente em 108, 180 países, líder mundial na produção de alimentos à base de cereais e, e que tem uma larga, vasta experiência ah, em sustentabilidade, em produção de alimentos sustentáveis. Mas, voltando aqui ao primeiro painel do Gus, Gus, é, é um, um administrador de empresas que, depois de 15 anos trabalhando é, em multinacionais, resolveu aí... Mr. Gustavo was... A, uh, he decided to become an entrepreneur, and and uh, he started analyzing consumer goods and consumer habits. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. We have two important topics: the an energy transition, of course, and the increase of of the food consumption. We also need to focus on decarbonization, on bioenergy, and uh, um, we also need to focus on not being dependent on fossil fuel. So we need to overcome challenges, overcome these hurdles and setbacks, because there are challenges to be faced in the next uh, 50 years. We know that we may reach 10 billion people in the world, so it's going to be a vast population, a huge population. And Brazil has a lot of advantages because Brazil has three, sometimes even four harvests around, along the year. So uh, we do have, we are one of the animal, pro, animal protein producers in the world, one of the main animal producers in the world. So I'm pretty sure that you know a lot about the future. You have a broad view of the alternative kinds of proteins and so that we can understand consumer habits, but also understand how we can meet the needs of these people who are under poverty line and who Dip, who must survive on uh, earning one dollar a day. So how can we feed everyone? It's quite challenging to think about that. We need to focus on social inclusion. We need to feed everyone. So we need to produce cheap but good quality foods for people who live under the poverty line. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much for your invitation. It's um, I, I want to congratulate the organizers here. I'm here today to talk about the industry of um, animal protein in Brazil and alternative protein, actually. And um, I've seen uh, other other presentations so i think uh, we are quite quite on the same page so i work for an institute for a food institute and uh, we we focus on alternative protein we have three pillars we have science and technology corporate engagement and policy we work with governments but also with the private sector so we want the sector to grow faster but also Sustain, with sustainability. When I talk about the global challenge that we have to face, I know that you've heard countless times about the global challenge. We, we have a global challenge, which is to feed 10 billion people by 2050. By the way, we have 
seven billion people and 820 million that are under the poverty line or they haven't had a meal today so it's a very uh, dramatic scenario and when we look at the data we have the pre-covid data but uh, it has gotten worse and uh, I think there will be more challenges because we had the swine uh, flu, we've had the, the COVID itself. So besides uh, food safety, we need to produce our food in a more sustainable way. So we need to produce more. And uh, some people here have, have seen it, have seen this discussion, have heard this discussion. Our food production is one of the most resp one of the main responsible one of the responsible for destroying the the oceans, polluting the oceans, polluting the environment, and so on, and the air, and so on. So we need to use less resources, but it needs to be healthy and efficient at the same time. And behind these challenges. We have solutions, um, and these solutions can be uh, used all at the same time. There are people who work with uh, zero CO2 emissions, the, uh, including this, um, this dairy uh, manufacturer here in Brazil. And we need to think about the alternative protein industry because this industry will replace the animal protein origin. So we need to focus on flavor, of course, on foods that people like, but it, the food needs needs to be sustainable. So when we look at the current world, we may ask ourselves, how can we create a world that is less dependent on animals? Just bear in mind that ever since the foundation of the world, we used to trade animals. So it was the first currency, by the way. And we had, we used animals as well for transportation, for human transportation which was something once considered to be impossible to stop using, but we did. We started finding other uh, efficient ways of transportation. It wasn't the veganism or, or, or um, vegetarianism, nothing like that, no. But we see transformations in three different industries, food industries, the industrial industry as, as far as uh, animal tests and product development. So we're talking about new technologies that came to stay and came here for a reason. And the reason is our habit, our eating habits. So when I talk about the problem, the main, core, the main problem of uh, depending on animal protein, maybe the solution would be easier it would be okay let's all stop having f uh, animal nutrition and animal origin at once but you cannot do that you cannot do that it's something cultural so uh, and the and the way society sees food so when you look at christmas christmas is a very typical party and a celebration. So uh, you cannot uh, stop eating certain types of food b during Christmas. So we, when we have a barbecue, we want to celebrate something. We want to mingle. We want to interact. So how can we deliver similar products, but it still not break the habits of this culture? And I love this quote by Peter Sanch. People don't resist to change, they resist being changed. So in regards to transportation, you didn't come here riding a horse, right? But you you rode a car and you drove your car, but you didn't ride the horse because you felt sorry for the horse. You just rode the car because the car is more efficient. So this is the theory behind it. So this is our theory of change. I'm sorry I misspelled it. 
But this is the change that we are facing now in the industry. We want to deliver the same kind of food that people are used to eating. However, we want to use new technology. So if you like meat, great, you can eat meat. It's going to taste like meat. It's going to smell like meat. It, the texture is going to be the same. However, it's going, it, we're, it's going to be employed a different technology and a new technology. You see, so I keep the habits, the cultural habits, but I change my carbon footprint i need I, ch I also change the the use of water the amount of water everything that is connected to our supply chain so there we use a pact in english so what are the elements that you use in order to deliver this uh, valuable things so there are always the same factors price convenience and taste. The people are worried about the, the price, of course, but they want the convenience. So they want to go to the supermarket and, and they want to look maybe on a delivery app. And also it needs to taste good. Uh, when it comes to awareness, you need to promote the new technology with consumers. So price, awareness, convenience, and taste. So this is what it stands for. And in regards to alternative protein, we have three technological paths. We have plant-based, which is not the idea of having a, a vegetable uh, burger, a veggie burger, but it's a, it's the goal is to to make something that really looks like the the original burger or the animal burger so you have fibers you have fat you have all these elements that can be found in the ve in the in the among the vegetables so you it can be a plant based such as soy um or um stuff like that and but it's all plant based uh, in regards to fermentation you have a, you you you're not I'm not talking about breweries or wine not at all but I'm talking about the use of unicells or unicellular use um, when you, you you know that there is this, this type of blood, let's put it this way, quotation marks, that is very similar to uh, human blood, however, is uh, plant plant based is it, it, it has a plant origin. It's a, it's a very similar blood, it's very similar to human blood. It has all the characteristics of uh, human blood but it comes from soybeans and you can use the bacteria to also to produce milk we have a cultivated technology which means you get a, a, an animal cell and you can make that meat in the lab so you are literally eating this meat this real meat, but it, this meat was made in in the lab. We've already started selling this product in Singapore. We have at least two big companies, big giants, saying that they are going to launch this product by 2024, JBS and another competitor. And they make um, they make partnerships with us. We also have um, startups. And 2024 is just around the corner, so bear that in mind. Uh, so what are we going to be facing in the upcoming years? And what will be the animal protein variations in the upcoming years? So you have some forecasts here. And the source is uh, from Kearney. This is, these are the market predictions for, uh, according to Kearney. In 2025, we will have 720 billion, and by 2040, 630 billion. We will have the, all the three technologies coexisting. 
fermentation, the traditional one. You, they believe that the traditional meat is not going to to become unpopular, but people will, consumers will worry about animal well-being, and of course, meat will become more expensive in the future. Where the market is going, the size of the these three industries, that the stage of technology, you can find all this data in our website, gfi.org. Here there is a QR code. Here we have a, a, a data on the market and technology and consumer research. They are all available there for us. And here, a very important point of this discussion. Now, when we ask questions and we uh, survey uh, plant-based customers, people who are eating uh, plant-based uh, uh, products, 89% of them are not vegan or vegetarian. So this is not a niche market for the 1% of people who are vegan. What we are talking here about is a variation in the source of protein. People who eat meat are also opening are also open to uh, consuming uh, vegetable uh, vegetable meat, and the same thing goes for dairy. You buy for most people will have a, an interchangeable product uh, behavior. They will buy cow milk and then vegetable milk, and they will vary uh, among these technologies. This is what is expected in terms of the growth of this market for the future. When we talk about Brazil, how, what is Brazil's position in this market? First of all, uh, it is it lagged behind at the beginning. This market started in the U.S. in 2008. The first company to launch this technology in Brazil arrived in the market in 2019, over 10 years of difference between the boon of this market in the US and the boon of this market in Brazil. But from then to now, Brazil has become a, po a power, very powerful. We export this technology to more than 30 countries from Brazil, from our production here. And why is Brazil one of the fastest growing countries in this? Why does Brazil have so much access to this technology and is doing so well selling this technology to the world? First, for intellectual capital. So the scientist who makes uh, meat can work to make uh, plant-based uh, meat. There are people who are specialized. We have laboratories. There is Embrapa, who is a very big asset, and the Estal and scientists who can do research on this. So Brazil is accelerating this research very fast. We have one of the largest grain production in Brazil. So if this meat is made of, uh, of soy, who makes soy? We have uh, free, uh, we have uh, available raw materials uh, at a cheap prices. We have a logistic route co uh, called uh, uh, so if I put one more box in the same uh, truck or in the same ship, uh, ship to the same uh, logistics routes that already exist, we have the largest protein companies in Brazil. It depends on investment of, of companies going after this. So traditional dairy and meat and egg companies are investing in this sector and making this transition as well. That's why it's very important to have these companies in Brazil. Finally, we have the la biggest biodiversity in the country. So on top of this, we have the possibility not only to produce these things based on soybean, but also used, uh, make products using the Brazilian biodiversity. One of the products we have in GFI is the direct financing of research. We finance research after uh, bids. We have 14 uh, research, pieces of research being used using Amazon and Cerrado uh, ingredients for uh, alternative protein. So we can have new scents, new sources of protein, new um, color addictives. We're using plants of the Amazon and Cerrado and other biomes in the country. And we add another layer of sustainability, that product that was already more uh, sustainable than the animal product that was being consumed. It can also create a, a, a much fairer production change that brings income to production 
uh, communities and helps keep uh, the forest standing and protect the Brazilian biomes. And we will have work a lot with uh, cattle and the theme of biodiversity and understand how we create this new production chain. I believe Brazil will be and is already becoming a leader in the alternative protein sector to bring a, a, cent a quotation from the Innovation Global Director of J JBS. He said this in at an event that I was there. I, I wrote this sentence that he said, it's not a matter of uh, if Brazil is going to be a leader of this sector, it's a matter of when. And this is what I would like to discuss here. When we talk about uh, the alternative protein sector, we, people who already work in Brazilian agribusiness sector, cannot see this as a threat, as something bad that's coming to substitute something we do well. It's the opposite of this. We are leaders in, agri in global agribusiness because we have invested consistently in science and technology in the last few decades, and we will only be leaders in agribusiness uh, in the future if we continue to invest. Brazil has everything to be the biggest leader in the sector. We need to invest in science and technology and develop the work of the companies and develop a, a regulatory framework with the government. If we continue investing in this technology, we have the capacity to lead the sector worldwide. I have here my contact information. This is a very brief presentation. We have data on all these sectors, market data, science and technology data, suggestions of public policies. So if you want to get involved, you can send us a message and uh, GFI work is free of charge. So all the consulting we give these companies uh, has no cost. Uh, GFI is financed by philanthropy. Thank you very much, and I'm open for anyone who wants to send a message. Thank you, Gus. Congratulations on your presentation. It is really something very curious and very current and uh, related to the future. I could ask, I, I will have to ask a question now. I, I, I can only ask one question. I think, I believe, I truly believe this is a reality. An alternative protein, as you said, it's alternative protein. I'm very concerned uh, when you talk about a replacement uh, protein, this polarization that this is better, it's healthier, it's uh, more sustainable, this. Uh, this course, I, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's complementary. We need to have a complementary food solutions, complementary mobility solutions and decarbonization. And when this position that we see on the media of this polarity of uh, what is better, what is not good, this scares me and puts the proteins on opposite sides. In my house, for example, and uh, uh, we eat uh, fish and poultry and uh, uh, vegetables and eggs and meat. And our challenge is to produce food at uh, an, uh, a sustainable, uh, at a good amount and at, at a good price, and eradicate hungers. I was in the biggest uh, food uh, fair in. Uh, in Europe, in France, in 2019, I saw they created a law prohibiting alternative proteins being called meat and being put in the shelf near the meat. The French people say, well, if it is better than the meat, if it's healthier, if the meat is bad for you, why do you want to call this protein meat? Or why do you want to to get my supermarket shelf to sell, to saying that it is better than my product, but it will get the same truck, my uh, sale, sales network, my logistics network. Oh, don't we need, this is a, shouldn't we rethink a, a position, a market positioning, a synergistic market positioning alternatives and that is sums everything that is available in terms of food for consumers. Maybe the habit, as you said, it's a celebration, uh, the feijoada, the Christmas dinner, 
people will not uh, uh, give up on their uh, people who will not give up on their celebrations are open to alternative uh, proteins. And I think the vision has to be this one: to build together a future that makes sense. If we're talking about a solution for uh, alternative proteins, but it will also go through uh, carbon neutral beef and carbon neutral milk. Well, this is better, but this is uh, this is better, but it's also also, beef can be better from another point of view. We have ways to improve the production of uh, pro animal protein, and all this has to happen from several points of view, uh, several aspects if you want to avoid the climate catastrophes, and we need to reduce waste. It's not a matter of or. It's not one thing that will solve everything. We'll need to join forces to have a better situation in the future. Thank you, Gus, and uh, congratulations on your presentation. If you want to learn more, access the website and send your questions for Gus to answer. Next block, we, we have the next speaker. We have uh, Barbara Solero as a zootechnician. She works at Nestle in the milk area. She is responsible for ESG milk sourcing and uh, training and technology sustainable practices, sustainable production practices, and I think it's very nice that she will come after you because uh, there is nothing as sustainable as a cow that eats grass every day and produces 40 liters of milk and dies of old age. So every day it is producing protein, producing protein. It supports families, uh, cows, uh, the in source of income of, of poor families in Africa. So, Barbara, can you please tell us about this vision of a sustainable production, cyclical and perennial production of uh, an animal that only eats grass or corn or soybean and can produce protein every day without being sacrificed, without being slaughtered? Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for being here. I think it is a very important uh, event, especially here in our panel. So thank you for being here to, ex to exchange experiences. Well, I will start here. Let's now connecting with the topic of our panel. It's true that consumers are increasingly concerned about the origin of their food how the food is produced, how this animal is treated to produce this milk. That is going to be a little bit of the focus here uh, of my speech. And we Brazilians, especially after the pandemic, I think the world in general, but here in Brazil, there are many, uh, many, many uh, pieces of research indicating that uh, consumers are increasingly concerned about the country, the planet, sorry, the, about the way this food is being produced. And I think they, they have been changing consumption habits and making this consumption increasingly more uh, conscious. So uh, then we connect with this sustainability issues of the planet as a whole, and together with this, we have the topic of uh, climate change, which is one of the biggest threats when we think of uh, ourselves as, so as a society, but it is one of the biggest risks when we think of the planet of our business as the largest uh, food and beverage company in one of the largest food and beverage companies in the world. This topic presents a, poses a threat. I think solving all this requires us to act urgently. So that's why we are all mobilizing ourselves this way in this on this agenda. And I think this is the reason why Nestlé has been committing to fight climate change and create uh, uh, um, an increasingly equitative uh, uh, economy of low carbon. And we have uh, global commitments to neutralizing uh, uh, 
GHG emissions and uh, a reduction of 20, 25% until 2025 and 50% by 2030. And 95% of our GHG emissions come from our supply chain of activities, for example, uh, uh, farms and uh, agricultural activities. And the way we are committing to fighting climate change when we think of the supply chain and when we think of the milk chain and how much it represents of our operations worldwide, but also here in Brazil, it is uh, based on regenerative uh, agriculture. When we talk about regenerative agriculture, we are talking about transforming the way we have been producing food and regeneration. When we talk about regeneration, we are thinking of rebirth uh, and reliving and uh, giving life, but it uh, is about giving back to the nature, the na its natural power. As regenerative agriculture talks a lot about this. Not that it doesn't have to do with technology. On 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 the contrary, I think we have seen this during this day. But resilience, or when we think of uh, uh, agricultural land, when we talk about uh, uh, milk, we have a cow, and what feeds this this cow? Because milk. It's transformed by the milk, but it comes from what the cow eats and the soil. We need to increase the resilience of this agricultural land, and it will be key for our future supply. All right, so this is a new journey, actually, and it's a new journey for everyone. Um, it brings a lot of benefits. It presents a lot of benefits, especially from end to end. From the moment that the food leaves the farm to the moment it reaches consumers' uh, dinner, dining table. So we need to strengthen the connection between consumers and farmers. And how are we going to do that? We need to bear in mind that we, we must uh, have this re this close relationship and communicate with them the best way we can because they must consumers must understand what farmers have been doing it's about lecturing educating consumers about this journey the production journey and when it comes to regenerative approach. I know it's new for everyone, and um, especially for farmers. I think that we have a lack of knowledge still, a lack of a specialized support and even financial support. We've already mentioned this here today, and this is why we've been uh, committing ourselves to our milk supply chain in order to foster and promote this journey and make this journey to happen. We have a strong partnership with Embrapa so that we can educate farmers. We've been doing this through our communication channels. We have a channel on YouTube and this channel is available for all milk producers. We tackle several types, several kinds of topics. This partnership with Embrapa, for instance, strengthens our the need and the intention of our of a, of having a competitive agenda. We want more people to have access to this information and not only people who purchase milk, but everyone, producers and consumers, everyone. I think everyone can benefit from it. We have been providing a specialized training for producers. Everything is quite new. So we have um, agronomers uh, helping them with uh, some decision-making points. 
uh, so that they can know exactly what to grow, how to grow, and so on. So we have a very specific work dedicated to providing technical support. We also have been providing a lot of acknowledgement. We have acknowledged their hard work. So uh, in regards to payment, the ones that are very acknowledged, we pay even we we pay five reais per liter, more than the, the other competitors in the industry. So producers have been feeling the effects of climate changes. We have had very heavy rains and then severe droughts as well. So we've had a lot of oscillations in regards to temperature. Crops have been hurt, and uh, they've they've been noticing these problems and these differences uh, compared to the past. And the new consumers, the new producers, per, have been showing these this desire of looking after their the upcoming generations and they want to do the best for the upcoming generations so how will the upcoming generations of farmers work will how, what will they do in the farms how are they going to produce milk in a sustainable and regenerative way so here is a picture of Julia. Julia is Gilson's daughter. She's only 15 years old, and uh, she is very active in the farm. She helps her father with all the decision-making process. Uh, she, she even teaches about climate changes. Anyway, she, she goes with the agronomist everywhere to the farm and her she dreams of becoming an agronomist she wants to continue her family business she wants to produce milk in a more sustainable and pro profitable way but also in a regenerative way so alagoas farm is considered to be one of the models one of the role models and they uh, they have a goal they want to become carbon free by 2025 so this makes this journey special to us um, not only Jusen's family but we also have uh, other 150 families that are embarking in this journey they want to focus on regenerative agriculture and they are gaining scale. They have been regenerating more than 5,000 acres. Here are some of the projects that we've been gaining scale and helping them uh, make the necessary changes in the field. We work, we've been helping them with the ecosystem, with the soil quality, the quality of the soil, biodiversity, and help, we've been helping them reduce CO2 emissions. Just to wrap it up, I'd like to show you a, a video, a video with Madalena and Gilberto. They are farmers in the countryside of Sao Paulo State. They didn't have any succession plan for the farm, and their kids did, weren't interested in uh, taking over the business. But ever since this regenerative system, they've been triggered by this interest in continuing the, the, the work that they've been performing and they've been doing in the farm with so much passion. So this video is just to illustrate the passion they have for the farm and for the regenerative agriculture practice. I know there are problems, especially when it comes to family businesses. 
Could you please play the video? Nowadays, we are going, today we're going to meet Mr. Gilberto, suppliers who are Nestlé's partners. Há 10 anos e que se regenera todos os dias. Aí eu peguei um monte de terra assim, e, e olha, tem as minhocas na minha mão aqui, ó. Um monte e olha, de minhoca. não tinha mais minhoca. Aqui não tinha mais condições é. de ter minhoca. Quer então, dizer, a, a minhoca ela faz é... adubo, né? Isso é uma amostra do que é o que solo tá já está sendo regenerado. regenerado. É. Se você vê uma terra sem nada, você fala, parece, parece que é uma terra morta. Mas ela não está morta, ela está ali só faltando, esperando que alguém vá e faça alguma coisa. Que você coisa para... faz com que ela viva. Você tira, você tem que repor, você tem que fazer manejo de tudo. Aí aquilo fica sustentável, né? Nós, nós fazemos uma, uma agricultura não sustentável. Por isso que nós chegamos, no, né? Só tira, 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 não respeitar. E agora, se não fizer essa forma que está fazendo agora... Não tem futuro mais. O que, que vai acontecer com a terra mesmo? Nossos Como é que filhos. Vai ficar a terra e os netos? Netinho? Como é que vai estar para os nossos netos, né? Para os nossos netinhos. A Mariana e a Alice, elas vão saber que os avós delas fizeram uma coisa diferente pela terra. Pelo mundo, né? Pelo mundo. Nós agradecemos muito ao senhor Gilberto e à dona Madalena. E que esta nossa parceria continue firme e regenerando por muitos e muitos anos. Essa é só uma das... So this is just a sneak peek of uh, one of the most beautiful stories and I'm very proud of being part of being part of this journey with uh, the farmers i'm just open to q q and a in case you have any any questions thank you very much it's so good to realize that you've been um, having initiatives uh, sustainable initiatives that can mitigate the uh, climate change i think the previous panel discussed this topic we have been focusing on supply chain, on how to mitigate issues and how to have more other sources of protein and sustainable sources of protein. But we've, we have to discuss here the consumer demands and JBS, Marfrigi, all these players in the market, they already they are already investing in alternative protein. Uh, why? Because consumers are inclined to buying uh, other sources of protein. And I need to provide this as a, a manufacturer or as a producer um, being in the food industry, I need to understand my consumer habits and I need to meet my consumer needs so my consumer can be um, very loyal to my brand or to my products. Exactly, exactly. So how do you see this movement inside Nestlé and, uh, and this proposal of uh, having alternative uh, sources of protein. How do you see the change of habit among consumers switching from animal-based or animal origin milk to other types of milk or alternative milk, for instance? Yeah, no doubt about it. I think uh, we, are, we already have plant-based products and so on. But the main point here is to offer products that are not only plant-based, but for all categories, organic, plant-based. We know that plant-based is a trend, and um, we must be aware of this trend. We must have availability, of course, for consumers, for all types of consumers, by the way. So we need to meet our customers' needs. Thank you very much, Barbara. Our next discussion panel, we have a uh, guest, Janelle Myers. And Janelle Myers, she is a chief sustainability officer for six years. Um, Kellogg is 
present in over 160 countries all over the world. And one of the things that caught my attention, that called my attention, was the slogan. And the slogan is, let's create the future of food. And in order to create the future of food, we have to take into account that the world needs to be fair, people need to be fed, but also need to be happy. So we need to feed people, of course, but at the same time, they need to be happy. They need to accomplish things. So I will hand it over to Ms. Mayers so she can share her point of view in regards to consumer habits. Thank you very much. So greetings from the Kellogg Company. Uh, you may know us uh, from either our cereal or snack products, but it is an honor to be here with you today. Apologies that I could not be there in person. Um, but one of the trends that we definitely wanted to speak to is what we're seeing from customers um, is that they are interested in brands with purpose. Um, up on the screen here, you'll see a picture of our founder, W.K. Kellogg, and uh, some of the quotes um, that we have um, from when he originally founded the company. And as you can see, the quotes are very inspiring. It does speak to um, investing in people, doing uh, the right thing is never wrong. Um, in those inspiring words, we find that he demonstrated that he cared about social and environmental issues long before, um, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of the trend, if you will. So today, what I'd like to do um, is to share with you how we continue to fulfill our founder's legacy, um, to address the issues most salient to our business and to our consumers. And I'll be sharing uh, our uh, Kellogg's Refreshed Better Days Promise Environmental, Social, and Governance Strategy. We call it the Better Days Promise. And as you saw earlier, um, W.K. Kellogg believed that part of running a good business was also doing good for society. And this promise continues to guide our, our company for over a century, and it remains core um, to our Better Days Promise. The way that we define a better day is a day where we see people are fed and fulfilled, a day where our planet thrives, a day where there's a place at the table for everyone. And our Better Days promise is to advance sustainable and equitable access to food by addressing the intersection of well being, hunger, sustainability, and equity and diversity and inclusion. In doing so, we strive to create better days for 3 billion people by the end of 2030. So now let's take a look at some of those specific uh, commitments and what our journey is. So here you'll see um, our Better Days promise. And through our Better Days Promise, we're focusing on the areas that are most material or business. So you'll see sustainability, well-being, ED&I, and hunger. So let me share a little bit of each of those, and then I will definitely dive a little bit more into sustainable agriculture, which is one component of our ESG strategy. So first, let's look at hunger. So we have a rich heritage and a long-standing history of supporting and enhancing feeding programs to address hunger, particularly for children. And I'll give a few examples in a minute. Our second priority area is well-being and how we nourish people through our foods. Each day, our brands deliver nutrients of need while also address addressing physical, emotional, and societal needs through programs such as, such as our Childhood Well-Being Promise. Third is our work to promote and infuse equity, diversity, and inclusion through our work uh, through recruitment and retention efforts, commitment to achieve pay parity, and provide training and career development. And we must reflect the diverse communities that we serve. And finally, we play a role as others on the panel as well too, um, in addressing climate change through our to sustainability. We are committed to sustainable packaging, supporting energy efficiency, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and continue to drive responsible sourcing to support soil health and reduce organic waste. And most importantly, our ESG strategy addresses the connectivity between these issues. And we really feel like that's where the magic happens. And so to give you a few examples, our changing climate directly impacts the health of people. It reduces crop yields and thereby impacts our food security. Often diverse and underserved communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And we're likely to see increased impacts because of existing barriers to health and to access of nutritionist food. And diverse and underserved communities are at most risk for hidden hunger as well as obesity. 
So let me go into each area just a little bit more. Hunger. So one of our commitments to the 3 billion is in the area of hunger. And feeding people in need is a has long been a cornerstone of our corporate responsibility ESG program. Since 2015, we've fed 195 million people throughout the globe through food, food donations and reached about 3.7 million children through our feeding programs. We partner with food banks on six continents, sponsor food drives to help stock community food pantries, and around the world provide essential food to those who are coping with natural disaster. One just uh, you know local example that I wanted to share as well um, is a program that we recently uh, con closed, which was a feeding and educational program called the Better Days to Grow Together program. This social educational program aimed to help 500 girls and boys and their families in Guatemala build new habits and improve their quality of life is one example. In the next area, we have well-being. And well-being, I mentioned, is about how we nourish um, our customers through our food. And food is definitely at the center of our ESG strategy as a food company. Our food system is under tremendous pressure uh, today and into the future. future. Malnutrition is prevalent at the same time the impact of food production on the planet um, is unsustainable. So we know grains and other plants are at the heart of healthy and sustainable diets. We're crafting foods that play important roles in people's lives and driving healthier foods. And with these efforts, we'll nourish 1 billion people by the end of 2030. In the area of Edie and I, equity, diversity, and inclusion is a high priority for Kellogg. We have two commitments here. By the end of 2025, we're looking to achieve aspirational gender parity goal of 50-50 at the management level. And by the end of 2025, achieve an aspirational goal of 25% underrepresented talent at the management level in the United States. And then this brings me to sustainability, the topic of the day. Before we get into our supply chain, I did just wanna share um, you know, some of our commitments in our own operations. So we do have goals around reducing our scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by the end of 2030. We're also focused um, with our suppliers and our growers to reduce our scope three emissions by 15% by the end of 2030. And I'll give you some examples here in a moment. Uh, we do have a commitment to achieve 100% renewable electricity in all facilities globally by the end of 2050. We're about 29% already today. We also have a goal to reduce water in our facilities in high water stress regions by 30% by the end of 2030. Then let me get into our goals specifically around our, I'm so sorry, one second. <laughs> Apologies, you might've just heard my, uh, my dogs, the hazard of working from home. Um, but when in our own operations um, and our supply chain, I just wanted to call out a few goals. I'm gonna give you some specific examples of what we're doing with growers. The first is that we're achieving 100% reusable, recyclable, or compostable packaging. The second is that we want to build resilient and responsible supply chains for our priority ingredients. And then our third is that we're supporting 1 million farmers and workers globally, especially women and smallholders. So here, I wanted to share a little bit about our origins program. Um, I know the topic of the day is sustainable agriculture. So what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about how we're engaging our suppliers and growers in our sustainability initiative. Uh, we have a number of what we call origins projects and here you'll see them as the spoons across this map. I'm just gonna touch on two or three of the examples today. But what these are, these programs were to enhance a number of environmental or social benefits. Um, we focus on these projects across some of our core ingredients, whether they're rice, potatoes, sugar, palm oil, and so forth. Um, and in those projects on the ground, we'll be uh, you know, providing uh, technical support with our growers, identifying what are the best sustainable agriculture practices for those particular commodities. And we'll be working on a number of environmental outputs, whether that's soil health, water consumption, livelihood of farmers, potentially um, biodiversity of the region. And so with that, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, a few projects. I'm gonna pick um, just maybe two or three projects around the globe to give you an idea of what we're doing. Um, for example, I'm gonna start with US rice. 
So earlier this year, Kellogg announced what we're calling our Ingrained Program. And that is a two million five-year program that will partner with lower Mississippi River Basin farmers to reduce their climate impact, ensuring that benefits the people and plant are ingrained in our food. Much of the rice that's sourced in this area is used in our iconic brands like Rice Krispies and Special K. The ingrained program will uh, fart, will partner in the Lower Mississippi River uh, Basin to reward rice farmers for the tons of greenhouse gas they reduce using a playbook of climate positive practices uh, that we've adopted for their farms. In 2022, Kellogg will pilot ingrained in Northeast Louisiana in collaboration with a leading agriculture GHG measurement firm called Regrow. Rice producers will be part of this program, the Kellogg, our Kellogg supplier rice mill, which is the Kennedy Rice Farm, and ag the agricultural uh, business firm Syngenta. The pilot will provide training opportunities in irrigation management, nutrient man management, and soil health to support farmer transitions to new practices. And then they'll be rewarded, we'll be rewarding farmers with uh, $20 per ton of greenhouse gas abatement um, on that these new practices achieve. These practices will be quantified with the Regrow Secure Measurement Reporting and Verification Platform. The pilot has the potential to reduce irrigation water, an important an opportunity to conserve the regions, the important regions, water resources, and reduce farmers' operating costs. Through the ingrained program, the partners estimate to reduce up to about 51,000 tons of greenhouse gas from our North American rice ingredient supply chain over the next five years. This reduction is equivalent of taking more than 10,000 vehicles off the road and feedback from participating farmers will shape and improve the program's implementation into the future. Another one that I'd like to share is uh, on a different commodity um, in Europe, focused on potatoes. In this pilot project, uh, Pringles, which is one of our key brands, Kellogg's famous savory snack, um, is supporting 10 French and Belgian potato farmers to launch the Origins Potato Program. Kellogg is partnering with its longstanding flake supplier, Clarabeau Potatoes, and Soil Capital, an independent agronomic technology company that supports farmers in the transition to a more profitable and regenerative agriculture. This pilot project supports farmers to, build, to help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and adopt more sustainable farming practices. And another one that I'd like to share um, a little bit closer to home uh, is our Mexico corn program. So this multi-year partnership with CIMIT, 225 Mexican corn producers and our suppliers exceeded our 2020 goal to reach 200 farmers who had begun producing yellow maize. The farmers received direct training to implement conservation agricultural practices and improved their farm productivity by about 36%. Because of the success, Kellogg and Summit just extended the partnership for another four years to expand uh, to more local sourcing. And we hope that the sustainability goals they will include, but are not limited to, Hector's manage with conservation agriculture practices and the greenhouse gas reduction. Those are just a few of the examples of some of our origins projects and ways that we're working with suppliers and growers on different type, different commodities trying to solve um, how to reduce climate change impact of those commodities, how to hopefully reduce um, water usage, as well as drive uh, farmer livelihoods. You can actually see a lot of our projects um, at Kellogg.com. We, uh, we do share some of the results of our projects. The last piece I wanted to talk about, because one of the questions was about um, engaging consumers. So we know that consumers are very interested in this topic as Nestle had just shared in the previous uh, presentation. And we're trying to find ways to bring these stories to the consumers and customers. Um, we've identified um, a number of different projects. So I mentioned uh, we've just launched the US Rice Program. We will be able to share that stories um, in, with retailers and with consumers on how we're supporting US farmers. We've also launched some other different projects. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the Simit uh, corn project. You'll see the Zucaritas box there. We've supported 200 Mexican farmers to sustainably grow a variety of maize, not common in the area. Um, down on the bottom left is an example where we have actually launched the first ever cereal eco-fill stations in Korea to reduce uh, plastic usage and really reduce, um, you know, uh, or really go after more sustainable packaging or eliminate packaging where possible. 
We're also updating our recycling labels across breakfast packs in Australia to make recycling packaging even easier. And then over on the right two examples, one of them is a program here in the United States called Michigan Mission Tiger, where we're helping provide access uh, to uh, more students through um, recreational activities and sports. And on the bottom is a really a very interesting technology called Novelons, which helps customers with sight impairment read our packaging and find it in store more easily. So there's just some of the examples of how we are engaging our customers and consumers in ways that we're telling these stories of how we're um, working on our different environmental, social, and governments topics like EDI, sustainability, well-being, and hunger, and different ways that we're engaging with uh, growers and farmers to help uh, to help make progress against all of our Better Days Promise goals. Thank you so much for the time. Um, hopefully, if there is time, I'm happy to take any questions or obviously able to take any questions afterward as well. Thank you. Ms. Mayers, it is a pleasure for us to, to uh, for us to have you here collaborating and contributing to this panel. I hope it in another opportunity to have you in presence uh, in person here in Brazil to learn more about our production sustainable production model so we can exchange experiences and information. And uh, we saw the map uh, that there are no actions with uh, growers in Brazil. So um, and I'm, I invite you to extend your programs of fostering and uh, technology to Brazilian uh, growers. Thank you. We do have some uh, programs in Brazil in development. Uh, we have not made them public yet, um, so watch for some new news uh, shortly. Thank you very much, the organization of the event. Thanks you for your participation. We ha don't have a lot of time, so we will now move on to the next panel. We have here to close uh, on a good closing, Pedro Arruda, who is the executive uh, responsible for uh, the International Sugar Organization. Since 2006, uh, a body, an institutional body, intergovernmental body that uh, makes uh, uh, economic analysis and public policies of sugar and ethanol, sugarcane ethanol around the world. Pedro lives in London and he came from London especially for this panel. And I, I think he has the opportunity to talk a little bit about this sustainable production of bio biofuels that has a lot to do with this uh, energy transition agenda, bringing other alternatives like bioplastics and other products, in addition to the cogeneration of uh, energy. So, Pedro, the floor is yours. We bring for please make your considerations Thank make you your much, remarks Elaine. it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here today um, to talk among such distinguished group of uh, speakers and audience it's a uh, it's a very pertinent topic and there's so much to, to new consumer demands especially in the world of sugar as you pointed out there are just so many facets and uh, so much going on but um, before we jump into these new consumer demands, I think it's pertinent and it's important to first look at how demand is currently uh, behaving in the world of sugar. Uh, because there are numerous challenges as well uh, that are current um, uh, in the world of sugar. So first off, let's, let's look at how the consumption, a brief overview of how consumption has been behaving. Uh, over the last few years and what we can see here is that actually the average annual consumption growth for sugar consumption is quite low when compared to other commodities. We see here a, a, a projection of only about 1.6 percent growth uh, recently and this trend has been decreasing over the years. Um, of course, there are various regional differences in terms of consumption uh, of sugar. Here, uh, there's a pie chart uh, indicating where uh, we see consumption 
uh, in different regions of the world. And it's very important too to realize and to understand that per capita consumption varies significantly regionally. Uh, so while in Africa uh, per capita consumption is quite low, uh, in Europe for instance is quite high and we've seen actually uh, in more recent times that uh, average consumption growth in Europe for instance has been negative. So it's been uh, decreasing. And here we can see a very revealing chart um, from the FAO and OECD comparing sugar to other different commodities. And what you can see here is that it's the only one that has a negative per capita consumption growth in uh, the previous decade. Meaning that the growth in consumption has actually been boosted by population growth. Um, of course, there's a number of reasons as to why um, consumption has been so challenged over the, the years, but I'd be remiss not to mention the, uh, the important, the, the big elephant in the room here, which is the whole sugar and health debate, which has affected consumption and continues to affect consumption. And uh, I personally feel a little bit unfairly. It, it's been uh, a target of, uh, I guess, a villainization uh, of sugar has occurred in the last few years. And uh, there's been a lot of misinformation. And I, I put up the, um, the logo of WSRO there for a reason, because they do fantastic work in analyzing and giving objective scientific analysis of peer-reviewed scientific papers um, regarding sugar and health. So it's, um, it's the World Sugar uh, Research Organization. I would invite you to, to have a look. It's uh, crucial to uh, developing uh, public policies that are geared towards um, more healthy diets, for sure, without the villainization uh, of a specific ingredients. But this has obviously led to public policies aimed at reducing consumption. This has led to the reformulation of products. And, of course, <clears throat> um, we've seen a significant rise in the number of sugar taxes uh, throughout the world. Here we recently at the ISO, we published this study on uh, sugar taxes. So I would invite you to go and check it out. But uh, you can see that uh, the number of countries that have implemented sugar taxes or taxes on sugar sweetened beverages has increased tremendously over the years. And uh, this is a trend that is continuing. So against this backdrop, against this uh, the scenario uh, and these challenges, Let's switch gears a little bit and talk more about now sustainability and initiatives uh, for uh, certification for, um, for consumption, for sustainable um, production and consumption of sugar. And uh, I've listed a few of them here. There are several more, of course, but uh, these are big ones, I guess, in the world of sugar. We have Bonsuko, for instance. They've, um, they've got production standards which measure um, the... Uh, environmental and social performances of uh, producers. Uh, we've got fair trade, for instance, where, where you have um, buyers that are willing to pay a little bit more, uh, which then uh, you have small holders, small producers that receive a premium, a fixed premium for their sugar. And of course, we have organic sugar, which I'm sure most of you know, uh, organic uh, certified organic production follows the whole ethos, the whole principles of organic production. So that means without uh, synthetic inputs, that means without the synthetic fertilizers. Um, and what you can see is that the, all of these certifications are very different between themselves. They uh, try to achieve uh, more sustainable production in different manners. But um, Let's talk a little bit about the organic sugar market. Of course, let me preface this by saying that it's very difficult to look at, uh, at the organic sugar market because there is very limited data um, in the sector. Uh, I mean, we, we at the ISO, we have 87 member countries. They report uh, raw sugar and uh, refined sugar uh, production to us. But it, being a, a relatively niche market and, and a fast growing market, uh, there's still uh, not a, a cohesive 
database for, uh, for organic sugar production. So recently, our member current countries have asked us to do a study on uh, organic sugar and to try to identify what the trends are, uh, where is this growing, how this market is developing. So we did this study a couple of years ago, thanks to our member countries who have helped us with their producer associations which, and their producers, which have gotten in touch with us and sent us data. But uh, what is interesting here is that you can see that production uh, of organic sugar has been rising and has been rising very quickly. Um, we can see here um, that in this map, which is also very revealing, that most of the production is actually uh, in South America. Brazil is a major producer of organic sugar who also happens to have a domestic market for uh, organic sugar. But uh, other major producers here in South America include Paraguay, include Argentina as a long-term, uh, long-standing producers. But increasingly now we have Colombia as well, which has been increasing their production of organic sugar quite quickly. And of course they benefit from free trade agreements to uh, Europe and which are of course the EU and the US are the largest market for organic products today. Um, here uh, in this chart we can see that there still is a significant premium in terms of organic sugar prices compared to conventional sugar and uh, as, as it's obvious of course it has to there has to be a premium otherwise uh, I don't think many producers would undertake the risk um, in, in doing such a, uh, an endeavor uh, unless they had uh, a, a payout, uh, a, a premium against organic, sh uh, conventional sugar. But what we can see as well is that um, the price of organic sugar has actually kind of slightly declined over the years as more uh, market entrants, as more production has appeared in the scene. But uh, I think another thing that we can see here is that it's much more related to the dynamics of the production and consumption of the organic market rather than variations in prices of, the, uh, of world sugar prices. Um, and concluding here the organic sugar segment, um, I think it's important to mention that while it is growing rapidly, it's still a very niche market and only represents about 0.3% of total sugar um, consumption. So there's uh, a lot of potential for growth, uh, but there are a number of challenges as well uh, in terms of scaling up production uh, because it requires a whole supply chain of, um, to be able to produce uh, this certified organic sugar. Now, I, I want to finish, and I'll, I'll be, try to be very brief as we're running out of time, but it's impossible to talk about the sugar sector without acknowledging the fact that sugar, uh, the sugar sector is much more than just sugar. Uh, it's a very integrated bioeconomy uh, sector, and it's got so much potential, it's so much uh, to give in various areas, um, such as bioenergy, and here I'm talking about cogeneration of bagasse, uh, bagasse-based electricity. I'm talking about biogas. I'm talking about biomethane, and of course ethanol. That's uh, crucial. These are crucial tools in our arsenal today in the world to be able to decarbonize transportation. And this is something that is increasingly demanded by customers around the world. These are viable solutions. These are drop-in solutions in many cases to be able to decarbonize transportation, and it, which is uh, an immense um, sector to be able to tackle. There's uh, a bright future ahead, I think, as well, even considering electrification of vehicles, because the battery uh, electrification isn't the only way that we can achieve the electrification, um, uh, of course. There's also the potential to use fuel cells uh, to, that use uh, ethanol uh, and produce hydrogen to then power our vehicles in a green and sustainable manner. So uh, there's 
a, a lot in terms of uh, bioenergy that the sector can still do. There's also animal feed that's produced um, from the sector and also uh, an, another uh, rising um, sector is the bioplastic sector which uses uh, ethanol or fermentation polylactic acid to create um, plastics that, that are much more sustainable than the fossil fuel based varieties. So the message is that there is a lot that the sector can offer and uh, I look forward to seeing where we will go and how this will scale up because it's such an incredible tool in our uh, arsenal to be able to de decarbonize not only transportation but several sectors. That's my message for you today. Thank you very much. I'm open to any questions in English or in Portuguese. Muito obrigado. Muito bom, Pedro. Obrigada pela sua. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's interesting to see this circular economy around sugarcane production, right? Because you can make sugar, which is food, and it's also part of uh, our guilty pleasures, right? Is uh, it? It can be consumed. I think sugar is part of our our indulging moments, right? <laughs> Even when horses do a, a good job, uh, we give them sugar as a treat, anyway. Or dogs, um, we all we all indulge ourselves because we need that extra source of energy. So that's why we use sugar, and we need sugar. So Brazil is a, a great tropical producer. We produce 130 tons of sugar, and we are on the right path in regards to decarbonization. We don't need to use the soil extensively. So um, we need to take that into account, right? So we need to focus on decarbonization uh, the whole route from the well to the wheel. So we need to look at the whole uh, supply chain and the whole production process from the bio diesel to the bioplastic and so on. If uh, we have the circular economy that can uh, create new jobs and job positions, uh, also getting people out of the poverty line uh, just like it happens in India, India is one of the uh, countries that are the biggest producers of, uh, of sugar in the world. So we, um, in other countries, I know that such as Asia, we don't have a high, high um, sugar consumption. However, in the poor countries, we do or the underdeveloped countries, we do. Um, and we started talking about the importance of the, the habit changes and the consumer changes, consumer habit changes, and how they all merge. And uh, we are on the same page. We are facing the same synergy in regards to supply chain, and this, they all can foster different eating habits, right? We don't want to be as dependent as we are in fossil fuels. We want to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, we know that there are people who are under the poverty line and they need to be fed. So we have 150 million people that became vulnerable due to the pandemic. So our mission here and our commitment is to look at this scenario from uh, a integration perspective. We need to integrate all areas. They need to emerge and uh, we need to produce healthy foods 
available to everyone, cheap, and also we ha must focus on social inclusion. We also must focus on generating income. We must invest in uh, infrastructure, schools, roads. We are all on the same page and on the same boat. We have a responsibility with the world. The world needs to grow and people need to eat. So I will wrap it up now in a nutshell. That's it. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been a pleasure to have each and every one of you with us today here. I think this is a forum that uh, is a global forum and we are discussing a very crucial topics that will play a very important role by 2050. Thank you very much.